Future man, take me by the hand, future man. Coming to save the day, future man. Bishop is his name, future man. No. I think, and then just like a future man. Future man. Bum, bum. Bum. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, hello, and welcome to this nonsense we call Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. Today we're paying up the hero from the future, the time-traveling superhero of the X-Men, Bishop. Uh, super excited about this. Um, he comes with a couple different options. I chose the hair option for this one, which just means I'm probably going to have to do another one because I can't just leave one option out. Like I just, I got to do them both. Like I'm a, I'm a sucker for options. Um, uh, I think we're going to do them in classic X-Men colors. Yeah? Should we do anything weird? Bishop, like, yeah. He's got a big red kerchief, and I love that. Well, they need that. I mean, it's a big red kerchief. You I mean, see, unless you want it to be magenta. I mean, we could throw some magenta in the bread. Ooh. Yeah. Be spicy. He's going to have magenta power. We really can have it all. You can have it all. Cool. Um... You should have seen the concept when I first drew it. The kerchief was gigantic, and because I have a I have a really bad habit of when I when I sketch out the pose for anything, and uh -huh. it has a cape or a scarf or a kerchief or any any. Uh, my partner's like, my partner was like, I respect you because in your mind, every piece of fabric is gosmer. And it's light. He's like gossamer in the wind. And just blows. And I'm like, yes, everything should just billow and like it's just billow. It's, just it's billow. called being dynamic. Yeah, kinetic. <laughs> or kinetic. The number one rule of all uh, atomic mass games is the, yeah. the be kinetic. Be kinetic. Be gossamer. Be gossamer. I like be gossamer. But gossamer. Gossamer. I hardly know her. But all right, I'll stop. <laughs> the best joke. Gossamer hardly knew her. I don't be spreading gossamer everywhere. It's like gossip, but not. Oh, see everybody. Uh, everybody. Uh, hello, hello. Blue and yellow for sure. Blue and yellow for sure. Uh, you leaned into the Days of Future Past movie version of the Half Cape Cloak Look. I did. Isn't shape the cake reducer? Yes, yes. Ultron 2 and the Mighty Corset gives strong billow. Yeah. And so does Beta Ray Bill, 100%. Uh, Def and Ray, hey Dallas, I got a ticket yesterday for one of your classes at Defcon. Awesome. How, how'd you get a ticket yesterday? They were sold out in like two seconds. I think as we get close, it's always important to have a look at what's available and if people dropped and. Put yourself you on the know. reserve Make list. Make sure. Right? Don't think that the waste, the, the waste list, the, the wait waste list, list is a waste of your time. Ah. Because it could be the key to your fun. Wait, oh, see, yeah, there was the wait list. Got mm -hmm. Def and Ray in there. Ultron and Beta Ray Bill have the best capes. The wait list, you have space sometimes. That's awesome. Congratulations for that wait list. Somebody, somebody got in something else and needed to dip, dip, probably. All right, we're going to start with the flesh tones. I'm going to mix something up. We should probably paint today. Call me crazy. <gasps> My mama sure did. It's got that little bit of beard, but we're gonna ignore that. Team create new bios for the characters, ones that work for a new version. Some of the back of most characters. Uh, I believe they all got new bios, question mark? I don't do bios. You don't want me writing anything but paint tutorials. Yeah, I'm not super sure what you mean, Mike. Uh... I think it's like the back of box text, like, you know, yeah. Red Guardian, a hero from, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, all, all I can say on that is that, you know, we want to make sure that stuff reflects what exists. We're not often, you know, only, only when we are invited to do we get to work directly with them on 
any kind of like interpretation, right? Yeah, I think it just means the back of box. Yeah. Like the Earth Mightiest get new character descriptions. Because like you would on, if if you do Captain America in a regular box and you do another Captain America, it would get two different bios. Oh, sure, yeah. I think that's what he's talking about. They're talking about not assuming anything around here. Ooh, future man, come and save. Take my hand, future man. He's from the future. <clears throat> Just finished up Red Guardian, excited for you to do X Men. Uh, why did you go to M Tattoo as a ray surface instead of inset? I thought for sure it would just get filled with a wash. Uh, great question. Um, anything that has to do with sculpting and engineering uh, for miniature is never a straightforward answer. And sometimes the answer we think we're going to do once you start engineering or um, or you get the test sculpt, it, it changes your mind and you have to, sometimes you have to be flexible and do what's best. Um, I remember like sometimes inset works and you go with inset and sometimes it looks weird because of the structure of the other elements around it. You can't take an individual an individual idea and just apply it across everything because what is around it can affect it. It's like Venom's thumb. People say, well, Venom's thumb, why is it cut off? And it's not until you like glue Venom's, like you have to look at the whole of the, you have to look at the whole thing, put Venom's thumb on his hand and then think about the casting process. And then immediately, if you know anything about uh, hard plastic injection, you will see why it was cut like that actually. Um, because the top of the hand would just be a big flat slurp. Like it would, it wouldn't, there would be this, 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 look at this, right? Um, a lot of it just depends on how it looks, right? Faces are weird and you have all this geometry, you have all this top, topography, you know, between the nose and the cheeks and the sallows of the cheeks and the eye sockets and the brow ridge. Um, and so things can look not the way you expect it even though you've done it like that before. So we like to stay flexible. We want to like be able to do what's best for the miniature um, and the design and not just go all like, there's no blanket statement. There's no, there's no atomic mass like rule book of when sculpting a, fit, a tattoo, it must be inset. Like there's none of that. You take each project as an individual challenge, look at the challenges it's presenting and, um, and make adjustments there. Moss face and chest, yeah, 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 yeah. Like it just, it just worked better on each of those elements the way we did them. Um, and actually sort of made them easier for painting. Um, Sometimes when you cut into a face, it looks really, really odd and it's actually harder to work around all the, the details. So we want to stay flexible. We want to stay loose. We want to try to provide the best version we can and stay true to, you know, our partner, uh, IP and uh, just make the the best damn miniature we can. So we go through we go through we we go through a lot of versions of these. Even like it's it's not just something gets sculpted and no one looks at it. It's it's it gets sculpted and then we look at it and there's whole teams looking at it and um, you know we uh, we get test shots and we 
we analyze how the miniature looks, how it works in three-dimensional space, um, you know, not just a digital space. Um, and we can go through, you know, multiple, multiple, multiple iterations of the same character trying to maximize the best version of, of the sculpt and, and what, what we can do, you know? Sometimes, sometimes, you know, something goes back several times, multiple times to, to try and get that best version you can get um, and, and make the best miniature you can, you can achieve. And still hit the deadline. Any tips or go-to method when you paint skin, how you layer it? Uh, you should be watching the stream right now. Uh, if you have questions. Uh, the biggest tips, the biggest thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do layers and I'm going to do blends. I do a lot of blending. Um, I use a method called the two brush wet blend. It's using two paint brushes. Um, one has got the paint. The other one is damp. And I use it to blend out those edges uh, with that technique. Once you learn it, it's, uh, it's a speed technique and also can make basically airbrush smooth blends uh, with, with a paintbrush. Um, I've, tricked, I've tricked painters in the past who are very good painters and um, they've been like, that's an airbrush and I've been like, nope, that's a, that's a paintbrush. Also airbrushes. There's no cheating. Airbrushes are just a tool. Like they don't make anything easier. They usually just make it faster. And it's just like any technique, just a totally different skill. Totally you different also skill. You have to practice. You gotta <laughs> practice. Yeah, airbrush takes practice. You don't just buy an airbrush and suddenly you're doing these awesome blends all over everything. It's it's not like that in any way, shape, or form, um, you know? Yeah, I've had mine for a little less than a year, and I just recently started using it on miniatures and not just terrain, because I feel like I have the control down. Yeah, it takes a lot to learn uh, an airbrush. It's, it's not easy. Um, I've, always, I've always been blown away when people are like, it's cheating. It's like, well, it's not cheating. It's a new tool. And, uh, you know, I, I use, I see it used wrong a lot, um, you know, so just because you did it doesn't mean, you know, you did it right. I see it used wrong a lot. So it takes practice and control and just like everything else. Uh, what things landed you on this pose with the energy on the hand? Uh, mainly the character, um, you know, I think when we first started concepting Bishop, um, so the first thing I remember, we looked at his first appearance, um, Uncanny X-Men number 282, um, that awesome, awesome cover. Um, you know, he's popping in um, and uh, getting ready to, you know, mess with the X-Men's day for sure, on that cover. Um, is he a hero? Is he a villain? Who knows? Um, and, um, you know, it's... Anytime you have a character with, like, really cool energy effects, I always want to kind of immediately kind of... That's where my brain sort of automatically goes. Um... Is like how can we how can we utilize the energy? How can we uh, manifest the special effects? Um, it's something that hard plastic has a sort of a nice um, ability to like really do some really cool stuff with the with the effects that other materials do not provide. Um, so you know. It's, 
it's something we get to automatically play with. And so it's, it's sort of an, an, an immediate discussion, right? How do we show the effects? So, and do we want it to be a focus? Do we want it to be um, sort of, you know, a sideline, like he's just kind of using it, or do you want him blasting? Like, so all the questions come up. Um, and then you just start ideating, having discussions um, with the team, um, getting sort of emotions and feels, like having somebody tell you about the first time they picked up Uncanny X-Men number 282 off the spinner rack and like, oh my gosh, they couldn't believe it. They were so blown away by Bishop and that first appearance and it was a super exciting issue for them and they still have it. Or um, maybe they were introduced to Bishop through the animated series and they just absolutely love the character. And so you just kind of start working on those emotional beats and like, you know, what what the character means to everybody and how can you how can you help tell that story in the miniature. During the design and posing process, do you say poses that maybe didn't work out in one piece but could work? Uh, oh, absolutely. I'm a firm believer in you never throw anything away. Um, you know, you know, we have whole folders like labeled like slush or something to, to that effect, right? And it's just like, just poses that we started and, you know, or, you know, the, you know, you might do eight poses for Bishop, but really like four of them are great, right? And you want to save those, you know? You have, you know, you, you do Magneto and you have, you know, three or four really amazing poses. Um, you know, this could be another Magneto. They could be another character. Like, there's so many options, so you never want to throw anything away. Um, even bad poses uh, sometimes can turn into a good pose later um, because maybe you tried something and it wasn't quite working, um, but you still got you still got your job to do. You still got to do the character. You still got to get, you know, out the door. Still got to turn it over to the sculpting team soon, um, so they can start their process. So you you know you 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 scrap the pose that didn't work, but later on you've done a bunch of other things. Your brain is in a new spot. You've um, and maybe you crack the code on it, right? Maybe you're like, oh. Do you remember that old thing we tried and it didn't work and it was really silly looking? Like, well, what if we took this, so what if we took this character idea and we incorporated what we learned there and we apply it to that old pose and then suddenly you have a brand new idea, right? You have a brand new way to approach something that you didn't have before. And so maybe, maybe it opens the pose up um, and gives it new life that you can use it on something else, right? So never throw anything away, never be afraid to ideate, uh, never be afraid to try new stuff. Um, just keep pushing and growing and learning and developing and all those, all those things that we should just be doing as a, as a good, well-rounded functioning human in society, right? Hey, hey, what's up, Board Game Geek TV? How's it going? Welcome to Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. Today we're painting up Bishop, time traveling X Man from the future. Right. The worst thing that happens if you try something new is you'll learn something. I always told my kid, you never learn by winning. You never learn by winning. You gotta, you got, you got, you got to take your, uh, you got to take the hits, right, and develop new skills constantly. Walt Millsy, hey, hey, vodka blitz, hey, hey. I don't want to start with dark blue, I want to start with light blue. When I paint blue, I always like starting with the light color and then the and shading. Okay. 
because shading blue for me personally is actually easier than highlighting blue so uh, a lot of times I like to just throw the highlight on and just shade down from there a little trick I picked up it's actually faster for me why do you think that is uh, blue such a, I think it has something to do with like the power and bulliness of blue. Mm -hmm. We've talked about blue being a bully color. Um, um, in general, shading is easier than highlighting anyways. So it can actually be a pretty solid tip to start with the highlight and shade down. Um, making sure, the big thing is uh, for newer painters, making sure you maintain your local color or the mid-tone. Um, I see it now on new players just blow out that mid-tone and you kind of just don't get the the local color anymore. And so things might feel muddy or sepia tone or black toned um, instead of like vibrant and blue. So making sure that punchy blue is there uh, first sometimes just helps maintain it as well. I'll show you how it works here. We're, yeah. we're, we're going to do it. We're going to do it today. I've seen you teach a lot, and I've never thought about that before, and it's breaking me. <laughs> I've never thought once about starting with the highlight color and building down from there. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just start with the highlight color. I mean, honestly, there's a there's some really good tabletop and speed painting techniques that where you only do the highlight yeah. color or the yeah, local yeah. color. Um, you know, I don't think you have to paint everything, highlight, shade, shade, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can do some really amazing tabletop level stuff by simply painting on the local color, throwing a dark line between all those local colors and calling it a day. And you can have a really amazing tabletop standard miniature very quickly um and just looks good it just looks good you don't have to do a bunch of fancy stuff yeah I've, I've definitely thought about doing that on um not just blue but other characters that have kind of darker tones but you don't want it to get muddy or mm -hmm. not or like lose the dynamic quality of like the variation um I have stuff to try. Hooray. <laughs> Hooray. Hey, Bishop. You're looking pretty cool. You're the man from the future. Something swimming pool. Seeker usually starts at the bottom and works their way up. You can go that way, too. Try to remember all this gribble he's got all over. He's got these thick muscle sleeves going on. Um, I, uh, you know what? I think that that... Yeah, it looks good. The colors, yeah, it depends on color. With a bully color like blue, it feels easier to shade down from that. Yeah, for me, it's, it's because blue is such a bully. It's such a bully. Um, it's a lot easier. So we're gonna mix our dark blue and our light blue to get like a nice middle. And we're just barely gonna shade. I'm not gonna do a lot of shading on this. Um, I, I wanna maintain that blue mid-tone. Um, I like keeping my, my colors poppy and bright. Zing. And I'm gonna blend that. You don't got it, you can do layers, you can do whatever technique you want. I'm just gonna blend, that's the way I like to paint. There ain't nothing wrong with the way you paint, it's just the way I paint. But I'm happy to teach you if you wanna. I'm just sorry that He's got giant leg muscles. A 
What character has been released you would consider obscure, underrepresented? How is it working on that skull? Mm. I mean, we started with Modoc, and I love Modoc, and I think Modoc, I've said it before, is sort of peak comic book design. Like, Modoc really shows, to me, the full potential of comics. Like, it's, he's so ridiculous and amazing, and I love how ridiculous Modoc is. So, we started out, you know, Modoc was in that, our initial launch, and being able to, like, bring that character to life was such a pleasure, um, as a character that I've always um, loved, and just, you know, he's he's out there. He's wild. Yeah, that new Modoc. Oh, just just a marvelous. If you can, it, it, that was one like the the concepting right. It's like it's the idea right is was sort of like okay, so we got a Modoc. How do you make? How do you take? that to the next level because it's it's a head inside a chair right so how do you make it dynamic how do you make it new and interesting um and so you know you just start doodling and drawing and coming up with ideas and you know it just worked um you know really trying to show that motion and that action of that character um, leaning into the ridiculousness, so you get a uh, a face sculpt that's like sort of over the top and maniacal, right? Like such a fun, ridiculous design in comics that really just shows like the 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 fun of comics. Mike Gillis, you know, if there's one thing I can do, it's keep a secret. And I will never talk about anything that's not released. We can talk philosophically. Oh, I forgot his boots are, his boots are blue too. We're going to do a little touch of this reddish brown, add it to this blue, so we're going to make more of a, a dark purple. For the boots. I love aim grunts. I love those uh, those amazing beekeeper hats. Um, you know, things go through a lot of ideas. We I always say there ain't no think wing thunk. Um, you know, just because we didn't do something or did do something doesn't mean we didn't think of another thing. Um, you would be surprised at the stuff we've thought about. Don't think we didn't think. There's a lot of ins and outs and moving parts to making making miniatures. It's not not always the not always an easy straight line path of obviousness. That's the guitar on Gwenham is the guitar from um, uh, what's her name? La uh, is it Lady Carnage that throws the guitar? It's being thrown at her and she's dodging it was the inspiration for that. Dark blue boots, 
Dark blue boots, time for a red kerchief, bold pyro red, hey, yeah. Gotta pop the top on all these, um, these monuments. Let's add, we're gonna add magenta to that, right? To the red. I mean, we could. I mean, I mean, I mean we could. If and you want to. Wink, wink, <laughs> nudge, nudge. Well, let's put a little. Which colors did I use for his skin? Great question. Uh, the I just pro popped it over to the mini cam for you. Or uh, the, uh, the palette the, camera. Uh, here's the palette. So we got burnt orange. We got, that's advanced flesh tone from Pro Curl. These are all Pro Curl paints. Advanced flesh tone, burnt orange. Um, burnt sienna. And warm brown, I believe that's warm brown. Wait, is that right? No. Mahogany. Okay. And so it's just uh, this is just this is just my layers of all those colors. So um, I typically don't have a recipe I'm working from. Um, I I really like to think about how to paint, not what to paint. Um, I can give you a recipe and I can say use two drops of water, but I live in a rainforest and you might not. So that two drops of water ain't, ain't the same at all. Um, you know, this is the way science works. Um, but also just philosophically, we like to try to teach people how to paint, not what to paint. I could just say, you know, layer this, layer this, layer this, but what are you, what are you learning? What are you developing? Um, so hopefully we can get you thinking about color, thinking about all the different ways it can work. There is no, especially when it comes to skin, there's no wrong skin tone, right? The, the, the scope and breadth of humanity is wide and varied and there's no wrong skin tone. So, Going in and just uh, making something up using using the philosophical ideas that we try to present in painting our mentors here on uh, Atomic Mass Transmissions Live um, is sort of trying our idea here is to sort of like give you an idea and a starting point to kind of develop the way you want, right? So I, I like a light tone first because it, it once again I start I kind of start for light on skin um, and even dark skin tone has very you know nice warm light highlights you still need a highlight and then I build up I think that little bit orange adds like that beautiful warmness to it right this this wonderful um, warm tone there that you can see right there and then bringing in those other tones as I work my way down. Um, and I may add a little bit more. I may, I may throw a little bit of green in there. All skin tone has a little bit of green. Yeah, look at dark skin tones. There's a lot of, or there can be a lot, there can be a lot of orange in there. Um, and then purples, there's, <coughs> you have to be careful with purples. Um, I see a lot of people put purple in, but they look um, sort of dead. Um, they look a little dead. And so being very careful with purple, because purple, purple in the eyes, in your eyes, um, is that of a cadaver, right? Like we, we recognize as a human species, that's not a good color. So it's, it has to be very, very careful in a very, very strategic application. Um, green. Why green? It's odd. Um, my skin has green in it, in the shadows. There's, there's green in there that if you had a color picker, you'd pick out. Um, green over red makes brown. Uh, so we got some warm tones in there. Um, that is good, Lil. Uh, so we're going to add a little green to our red and make a richer brown. Just to add 
some tonality to that shade. That's all we're trying to do is just create some variations, especially on somebody like um, Bishop. Bishop's rugged man of the future. He's future man. So adding that little bit of green to very strategic places, that green's going to mix with that um, red to make a really, really nice brown. Um, and it adds that like rugged shade to like say we we're going to put it on the lower jaw right on our cheeks you're barely going to see it it's just it's just a kiss of it it's just going to blend away and so it gives that sort of um little touch of that rugged um maybe hairy beard right or you know we've done We've done uh, a lot of skin tones on on here. I've done a lot of uh, um, video tutorials about it. Um, you can go back through our YouTube and you can you can find a bunch of them um, where I talk about like lots of different ways to to approach it. Um, but I definitely encourage you to explore and be very very. Um, adventurous with skin tones like you, you literally can't mess it up right um, you know someone out there has probably has that skin tone you mixed up right it's you know they're all unique they're all interesting they all have like a visual story to tell and so you can kind of create that story yourself yeah green green is a green is a powerful tool when you're painting skin look at classical uh, like even classical art paintings, right? Um, you know, the, the most famous paintings in the world probably have a green underpainting uh, and that green reads through, right? It shines through and it's, it's in the shadows. They maintain it in the shadows um, because it's just there in the skin um, to varying degrees. Um, I primarily try to let it blend away with the way I paint. I wanted to create like just some tonality. Skin has so many tones in it, right? Like all these wonderful and beautiful and gorgeous little imperfections. Um, so any sort of like time I can add like a, even just a little bit of tonal variation to create some of that idea of human imperfection, even on my super perfect superheroes, um, I think, I think it, it, it's just humanizing and just reminds us that, you know, we can all be superheroes, hopefully. And we're going to dark this down just a little bit. We can add even a little blue. Um, we're going to take this blue. This is that purple color from the boots right here. We're going to grab it. We're going to put it over there. Let's take a little bit of this tone here. Maybe a touch of mahogany. Oh, look at that color. Nom, nom, noms. Nom, nom, noms. It's super dark, right? But not it's not black. And that's super important, right? Um, we can do some little scritches. It's so interesting that you brought up looking at, at paintings because I do feel like if it's breaking your brain to, to think about color theory as, as applied to like a miniature, going to your local museum or, you know, where you can look at paintings up close that are larger and start to see it in effect there is so helpful. Well, even, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, online, I guess. obviously I'm going to drop the, the notion that, you know, Adepticon is coming up very, very soon. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of very wonderful, high level painted miniatures there. And going and looking at high end painted miniatures and seeing how these artists are coming up and, and adding that tonality and that visual interest to two miniatures in different ways and seeing how it applies to miniature art is, is always interesting too. Yes, 
I'm, I'm also agreeing with you, like going to the, oh, sure. going to the museum. Um, I mean, I don't know if you know this, um, you know, I've been to Chicago and Adepticon numerous times and um, there's, there's a, there's a wonderful art museum nearby. Um, if you ever make it out to Philly, I went to the Rodin Museum oh, yeah. and was just blown away. Like, I'm not a sculptor, and I immediately came from the Rodin Museum, and I'm like, I think I can sculpt. Like, I, I just, I, I really want potential. To, like, I really want to just sculpt now. Um, but yeah, looking at different artists, how they apply colors, why they apply the colors, um, you know, is a big one. Why did they do it? Um, this is why um, art classes do like master studies where you literally just copy a masterpiece and that way you, you start breaking down like the why, right? Like, um, why'd they do that? Why'd they paint like that? Well, if you start doing it like that, then you can start understanding the why. Um, and so that's kind of like my philosophy for these streams is like, start doing it like this and then break down the why and then you can break my rules and apply your new rules and come up with new ideas. I know we talked about like pointillism at one point on a stream. I don't remember when it was, but if oh, yeah. you do have some extra time in Chicago to go to the Art Institute, if you have an extra day or afternoon, um, you can see those Surratt paintings, uh, like Sunday on La Grand Jatte and things like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And if you're confused about, you know, the method of like mixing color as opposed to just using what you get out of out of the bottle, whatever paint line you're using, you know, it is helpful because when you walk up really close to those pointillist um, paintings that Surratt did, you can see the individual colors that were used and then mixed by your eye when you stand back from it. Yeah, that's why cameras always, like, people are always just like, my camera makes my miniature look worse. Well, the camera doesn't doesn't blend stuff together like your eye does. Your eye fills in a lot of blanks. The human brain is not super good. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a muddy mess in there. Um, we blend stuff together with our, with our brains. Um, and then the camera like does not, and so then you look at the camera picture and you're like, wait, that doesn't look like that. Well, yeah, it does actually. Um, the camera is just forcing you to look at the thing that your brain doesn't want to look at. Uh, interestingly enough, add a little uh, cold black and darkening stuff up on the hair. Yeah, I might literally have to go back and do a bald head version too. Come on, talk to me. What other questions you got? I love answering questions. Questions I can't answer. Oh, here's one from Daz. Do you want me to read it out to you? Yeah. Uh, do you consider the difference between the wet paint color and the dried paint color? I have some paints, parens, that I like, clothes parens, that I now know will dry down differently. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're really, you're really working toward the dry effect, obviously, because that's the end effect. Um, so learning what colors do what. Um, I typically don't care too much because I'm... I'm an adapt as we go kind of painter, personally. Um, you know, I, I let things happen and then I, I'm like, well, that, that's how that looks and now I'm gonna do this to make it look like this. Um, but you should, yeah, you should definitely think about what your end result is and what's gonna get you the end result. Well, it also refers back to your um uh, you you said a few times I know on stream like to be thoughtful and allow the time to think and if you let something dry down then you're working from what is rather than oh God I did a bunch of stuff at once 
and now I have even more. And if you work in careful, thin layers and you let things dry and you look at it, then, you know, as you have said many times, it's the fine art of correcting one's mistakes so you can make those adjustments. Yeah, that's definitely, I definitely highly recommend a lot of thin layers and build up um, than just kind of this glopping on one massive layer and calling it a day. Um, you you want to be able to be agile and adjust and be be able to... Um, I'm suggesting patience. It seems <laughs> rude, we know, but the paint does need to dry. <laughs> it does need to dry. Um, that's why I bounce back and forth between different elements. Um, I want to give my paints an op opportunity to dry and be the paint that they're going to be. Um, and that's why I paint in such thin, thin layers. Um, I've never stripped a miniature ever, like at all. Um, I, I can't. Um, I, I don't, if you paint with thin paints and you build up, you, you literally have no reason to strip the miniature. You can, you can paint right over top. Um, there is a limit, obviously. Uh, the goal is to not hit that limit. Um, but I, I don't think I've ever hit a limit of like, well, literally can't paint anymore. Like that, that just seems like a lot of paint and a, and a number of paint layers that I've just never hit personally. Um, how far says bold to patience? Jimmy is asking how many folks from AMG are going to be at Adepticon. Uh, oh, how many? There are a few people that are that are going as attendees and not for work so that they mm -hmm. can enjoy the show. Because believe it or not, we also enjoy fun. Uh, <laughs> like to like to have fun and play games. Um, and then there are a handful of people coming uh, to, to run various aspects of our presence at the show. But it's not like who gets to go, who draws uh, straws. It's like who needs to go because, you know, something that they do or run is, is happening. So I mean, it's, it's I, kind of a boring answer. But <laughs> yeah, it's a boring. I mean, I have to go. Yeah. Like I have to run the worthy, um, so it's it's kind of like automatic. Like I have to go. Um, yeah, there there are certain people that when we talk about going to a show, it's like they're just going, right? Then there are certain people who go if we're doing particular things, or um, you know, some of it is like meetings and things like that. So it's it's definitely a boring answer. I wish it was. I wish there was some, you know cool game we played to get get our spot but usually it's just based on what your job is and whether you need to do that job at the show <laughs> add a little blue to the red to make a shadow blue blue mixed in red makes a wonderful shade for reds what do you consider the optimum viewing distance for a mini, especially when judging? If it's too far, I assume some of the cell shading is just not visible. Oh. The optimal viewing distance for a miniature, it, it depends on the destiny of the miniature. We talk about the destiny of the miniature. The destiny of this bishop is to be cool and done so I can put him on the table and kick some ass. That is his destiny. Um, the destiny of something for the worthy, of course, is to be um, a piece of art that tells a story that inspires people and is particularly going to be judged. It's going. It's going to be judged. Um, and you know, if you're not comfortable with being judged, and you know that that's a different topic. Um, and judging your mentor is not a judgment of you. It's, it's a judgment of your mentor uh, for the worthy is, is not a judgment of 
your skill or you as a person. It's a, it's a place for you to come and learn something and ask how to get better at the level you want to get to. Okay, so that's a little off topic. So the viewing, aim, uh, the viewing distance depends on, literally depends on the, the miniature's goal. For something like this, for like tabletop, everybody says arm's length, right? If you can hold it out at your hands, at your arm's length, and it looks good, then for tabletop, you've done it. Uh, for a studio miniature, no. For a display miniature, I always say it's, it's half my arm, and sometimes I need to take my glasses off. For a studio miniature and a competition miniature, it's, it's literally, I'm going to get... I want to get up in there and see what you did. And because like sometimes, especially when you're judging like a competition, the difference between a gold and silver is an application of a shadow or the misappropriation or the missing of a mold line or something like that. Like it can be literally just the tiniest thing that separates. Um, so I, So when I'm judging, I take my glasses off and I get up underneath the miniature. I, I, I'm looking at every line, every texture, every blend, uh, and then I pull it back and I want to see the overall effect. Like it's, it's both, right? So, so, so competition has like multiple like optimals. Studio has like two optimals. Like it's got to look super good in person um, from a case standpoint, but it also has to photograph wonderfully. Um, display it needs to look good on the uh, display needs to look good in a case. It needs to look good on shelf. Tabletop needs to look good on the table. So that that's my short dirty answer. That's a short dirty answer. My goes to this line miniatures. I've definitely seen my skills improve though. My Black Widow has a lazy eye. It's a sign improvement when my Black Widow does not. Yeah, that's that's it. That's uh, that's it. It may seem silly, but you but do you find yourself getting pretty high on your highlights and deciding certain spots are too bright? Um, I am a firm believer you can, you can't blow out, a, you can't blow out a highlight. Um, I highlight the heck out of my stuff. I like bright highlights. Um, there are times you need to pull back. That's usually a composition. You're starting to get into composition. Like why does that need to be pulled back? But somewhere else doesn't. So you're, you're, you're thinking about composition and some, some higher, philosophical stuff um but i i'm a big fan of big highlights i i like a good big highlight i like a good bright highlight i tell when we're when we're, when we're working with a, a a a painter for studio stuff that we haven't worked for uh worked with before i'm always just like and don't be afraid to take those highlights to 11 like do not be or even even somebody tabletop, like, don't be afraid to take those highlights to 11, right? Let those highlights sing. Let them read. Pop them. Like, get some light on there. Um, you know, especially if, if you're doing your contrast properly and you're getting some nice dark tones in, around them. Like, that's just part of another version of contrast, right? There's multiple ways to create contrast not just light and dark right we've talked about this before sorry for the uh um the old timers welcome newbies um light dark hard soft hot cold texture not texture like it's there's lots of different ways to create contrast uh the most obvious one for most new painters um or tabletop painters is is light to dark so Cranking those darks down, cranking those lights up will get you contrast and pop and make it sing on the tabletop. I like rhyming stuff, by the way. Uh, how do you feel about repainting older mistakes you can now fix with new skills? Um, so, I'm going to answer this way. I'm going to answer this question a certain way. And you're going to be like, of course you're going to say that. Um, you work at the company. Um, but this would, this applies for me even if I didn't. 
Um, I typically do not go back and fix anything. If I feel like the miniature wants to be fixed, I tend to just paint another. Um, once I am done, well, first off, art's never finished, it's just abandoned. So just first off, like, you never finish art, you only abandon it. Um, but for me, I've always, in 30 years of doing this, 30 some years of doing this, I've been doing this a long, long, long time. Um, I, I'm a go back and do it again on another miniature. And the reason is I love having the physical representation of my progress maintained. I love having that miniature next to the new one. I like having the old one next to the new one. I want to visually look at and see that it's it's right there. Look at what I've done. I can visually look at the the you know the flood of the flood of 1903 compared to the flood of 1998, right? I can see the watermarks. Um, I absolutely love that. And, and for me, I need that way more than just uh, scrapping over uh, a miniature and being like, well, I'm pretty sure I remember what that looked like. I got this crappy cell phone pic though. Um, I want to see it. So that, that's just me. El fire spray anti. Oh yeah, I'll be there teaching classes. So will Brendan and Sarastro. Um, so yeah, I have to be there. Um, I just did the best eyes I've ever done, but so has big eyes to make it easy. Soka does have big eyes, does make it easy. But it's a good place to practice is on big ones. I like a good bright highlight myself sometimes for myself logically. Something like Star Lord's jacket in my head is more grungy to say Captain America. Yeah, and I mean that's con that's just figuring out the contrast, right? Like so. That, that's figuring out, the, like you're, you're starting to think about some bigger philosophical things than just tabletop painting if you're thinking about that, Brian. Like the jacket should be grungy so it doesn't go to white, but the metal should go to white. Maybe the, the eye, the glowy eyes, like need a little tiny white dot. Um, maybe the blues don't quite go to white or maybe it's just a slightly off from blue white, right? There's like that creates visual interest and contrast across the miniature. So learning how to apply when it needs to go to white, when it doesn't need to go white is very smart. Something like um, Tony Stark, let's say we're using, well, who's got two different, I need something with, somebody with two different materials, shiny, shiny material and not so shiny material. Uh, Ultron. Let's say you're doing Ultron in non-metallic metals. So, so you're not using true metallics, you're using non-metallic metals. You want that silver to go to white because you want to show that it's super, super, super shiny, right? Let's say you were doing a black armored Ultron. Uh, his armor, like shiny black, right? Like like slick, shiny black, like a, like a black Lamborghini uh, Contosh, right? Like you'd want that 80% black and then like those final highlights would just be the brightest whites and they would just be singy and poppy. But then his red cape wouldn't go to white. You'd have that go to like an orange or a salmon, um, you know, depending on which way you go. And the, the highlights would be broader and not as sharp, right? So not as tiny. They'd be big, broad highlights. And on the black, you'd have like these little tiny like ping, 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 ping highlights. That shows two different materials. One is showing hard, metallic, sharp surfaces. The other one's showing a soft, cushiony velour, right? Like, so look at different- Gossamer, velour. Gossamer, velour. I'm on, I'm on, all, I'm on, it's, look, it's all about, it's all about capes. It's all about those textiles, baby. Textiles. Um, even just looking around the room right now, we have a, a black camera. The camera is, well, not very black, actually, like if you, spot colored that it would actually be grays 
Um, and then like it has like these little tiny lines around the edges of the bright highlight. And then on the corners a very, very bright light because it shows how hard and reflective it is. But then over here, like on my, on my, on my hoodie, right? There's no bright highlights because it's soft. It's cushiony. It's cushiony. It's cushiony. Andrea's having an existential crisis from realizing all art has been abandoned. That's the way it works. Look, if you're not hurting, you can't art. <laughs> right? Right? You definitely have to be wanting to say something. And a lot of hurt people have something to say. I just want to say I love a good nap and a cup of coffee. Fair. That's Reasonable. That's, that's what my art has to say. I love a good nap and a cozy... I think after stream we can have one of those things. <laughs> It's still I mean, I haven't had lunch yet. I'm just going to use my lunch hour to take a nap. A little nipper nap. Love that for you. A little midday nipper nap. <laughs> Maybe I'll make some cocoa. I don't know. <laughs> Let's get crazy. Yeah. I'm also cozy. I'm going to go get cozy. some marshmallows and make a cocoa. Okay, Maybe. hold on. Now you're selling me. Uh, I mean, look. Uh, I think we're going to make cocoa this weekend. And I think we're going to get the big giant marshmallows yes. that you you put in the cup, mm -hmm. and then you put the cocoa around, and you just got this giant marshmallow inside the cocoa, basically. Yeah. I'm here for it. That's. I think that's what's going to happen. I'm and a, a little jealous, honestly. I'm sorry. It's okay. I mean, I can make cocoa next week. Sounds great. Yeah. See you there. See, that's what's going to happen. This is the way it works around here. Problem it's solved. Just nonsense. All right. Uh, what were we saying? Um... Aside from marshmallows. Oh, damn. I was waiting to see the yellow. I'm sorry we didn't get very far. I'm so sorry. We've done yellow before. Look it up in the past. We've definitely done yellow. Fun fact, start with a little brown, then put yellow on top. And don't 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 just try to go in on like bright sunshine yellow. Like like use like a ochre or a sunny or a more more orangey yellow and then use that sun sunny lemon yellow for the final bing bing bings. Or sometimes you can get a good one with it, with using like a pink or like a salmon shadow on you. Yep, you can you can layer pink, um, especially like I know uh, the pale pink from Procryl, layers on in one good coat, um, yeah. and then paint your yellow over top of that. Champagne wishes. I thought you were gonna start singing Taylor Swift, but or um, Oasis. Uh huh. Yeah, who knows. Who knows what's going to happen. All right, thanks for joining us. Uh, remember, every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, right here on Twitch is Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. We hang out, we chat, we paint some stuff, we answer questions. And that means, because I said Tuesday and Wednesday, tomorrow's Wednesday, you get to do it again. Uh, so you should hang out and come and join us. Bring your cats, because they're adorable. Um, and remember, for all the latest news, information, and announcements coming from Atomic Mass Games, you should check us out on Twitter and or Instagram. That's where we post the news, the breaking news, the bah, 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 news stuff coming. So until tomorrow, we'll see you then. The, yeah, you're laughing at my... Uh -huh. We're going to do the telegraph <laughs> and send out the signal <laughs> over the wire. This just in, the, Marvel Crisis Protocol. Marvel Crisis Protocol, I'm coming to a store and hear you. All right, bye. I'm just going to pretend like the camera's already off and just, yikes. Oh my I did it.